All right, now without further ado, uh, Prem is part of the next panel, clearly, and uh, allow me to introduce our fearless leader right here, the one and only Melissa Sands. You can call her Mel. She's uh, usually involved in all the great events across the nation. Mel, of course, is never not busy. Uh, we were hanging out in Dallas. She's part of the Uncomfortable thing, a few other things. Mel, can you break it down like a fraction, the great things that you do? Thank you. So I have an events background, so I immediately was drawn to the Bitcoin community and um, decided what my place was going to be. And because of that event experience, things like this are right up my alley. And I worked really hard to learn as much as I could and... Um, I actually ran Unconfiscatable last year in December. So I love the community. Fantastic. All right, now without further ado, Ben, are you ready to take the stage? All right, we've got a center seat for you. Come on up. And Cedric is here with us as well from the Bitcoin Matrix. And uh, Mel, take it away. Okay, so Melissa Sands is my name, um, AKA Mel. I bought Bitcoin in 2015, but I got involved with everything in 2017. I, once again, have experience in hosting my own vintage and antique events. And last year I worked at almost all of the major Bitcoin events and ran Unconfiscatable. So my involvement has had a lot to do with in-person events, which I believe are very important. And so I would like to ask you three fellas to introduce yourselves and say what your part of the Bitcoin community is. Prem, would you like to lead this? Sure. So since I already had a moment to kind of say something, I'll, I'll be very, very brief. Um, I mean, my role in Bitcoin is simply to, uh, to show up at brunch for five hours every Sunday. And I do a few other things, but to me that has been the most important, the most impactful uh, thing involving Bitcoin and me. And, it, and it's allowed me to meet a lot of people. It's created a lot of opportunities or, or exposed me to a lot of opportunities that I'm very thankful for. And so uh, just being able to kind of uh, be a gathering point for Bitcoiners, for people who come to Miami who are interested in Bitcoin, that's, uh, that's been my, my role. Hello, everybody, and we're live. Uh, hi, I'm actually Bitcoin Ben. Excuse my voice. I talk all the time, so I don't have one anymore. Uh, I am the owner and operator of the world's largest growing crypto and also Bitcoin, of course, uh, club network in the world. I have a club in Sarasota, Florida. I have one in Nashville. We're launching our one up in Boston. We're launching one in St. Louis. We're launching one in Texas. So far, I've put in probably about eight and a half million dollars of my own money doing this. And the reason I'm doing it is because of freedom. My name is Cedric Youngleman. I host the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Uh, about three and a half years ago, uh, I wanted to find people to talk to about Bitcoin. My family and friends were sick of it. So I started the podcast. Uh, I guess I'm one of the, the only one who doesn't do the thing in, in real life. Uh, I, I also don't like to leave my house that often or do anything. So it was a great way to connect with people and bring uh, the action to my office. So. Okay, so... We're going to start with our first question, and Cedric, I'm going to have you start. Do you think the Bitcoin community is culture or a Kool-Aid drinking cult? Uh, I think it's mostly uh, cultured. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the whole idea of Bitcoin is to not drink the Kool-Aid. And so... Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some Kool-Aid drinkers in the mix. I mean, you're going to get, you know, that anywhere. But I, I think it's mostly truth seekers. And, and so I, I think of it a lot in terms of the culture, because I don't think there is a distinct community. There is no group. There's no, it's just a bunch of individuals looking for maybe similar type things. But I, I, I relate it to maybe like hip hop, 
where you know there might be some similar clothing or fashion or music or other things or, or jargon, uh, and it's just like a movement. Uh, so, it's kind of what do you think? It's a revolution, and you, me, him, we are the front lines to the average Joes and Janes. All right. The reason I launched the clubs, because the average person, now mind you, the last group that was up here, I love all of them except that last asshole, <laughs> which he was an asshole. It's as they help the rich people get richer, God bless their heart, I want to help the little guy who's... <laughs> All right, anyway. Those who watch my show, I get emotional. While they're worried about getting richer, the people that walk in our clubs, they're worried about gas money. They're worried about price of eggs, not because it's a commodity and I can trade it on the fucking New York Stock Exchange, because they gotta fucking eat. We are the front lines of the real people. And to tell you the truth, I give zero fucks if all the rich people die. You know who I want to save? All the people that built America and built this world. Don't... <laughs> let's not say fuck the rich. Let's just say let's ignore them. I agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment. You know, I will oftentimes bring up at brunch. My concern, I grew up, uh, was raised by my mother. My parents split up when I was four. She was an immigrant from Brazil. So I was primarily raised by a working class immigrant in this country. I have a very, very different point of view on this world than most of the people who get up on these stages. And when they're talking about investing and hedging and how to make your money work for you, I'm like, 80% of this planet lives on less than $20 a day, okay? Can you imagine living on less than $20 an hour? But so I'm very, very concerned about the majority of this planet. Ignore the rich, who cares what they do? We need to, what are we gonna do? What are we doing to build our better world? Our citadel in the cracks, as I like to call it sometimes. And so, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Is, is Bitcoin a cult in, in certain ways, right? I mean, we say like the toxic maxis. I tend, I'm a Bitcoin only kind of person. I don't, I'm not an investor. I'm not a trader. I'm not worried about the price of Bitcoin today, tomorrow, or any particular time. I'm only concerned about does the Bitcoin protocol work? If it works, if it's running, if it hasn't been hacked, if it hasn't been broken, then Bitcoin is good. The price I don't care about the price because the price in dollars is a logical fallacy. Not, the dollar is not the same thing for everyone. The closer you are to the printing press, the much less valuable each individual dollar is. The further you are from that printing press, if you have to work a 40 hour a week job, if you have trouble, if you struggle to support your family, then those things, you know, the dollar is the reason why you're struggling so much, even if you're working so hard. So I hate the idea of pricing Bitcoin in dollars. I mean, I know we can't avoid it. This is the reality we live in. This is the circumstances of our economy. But I say that the so-called volatility that they were talking a little bit about in the last panel, I say the volatility comes from the insanity of the dollar. It's not coming from the, the value of Bitcoin changing because the value of Bitcoin is not changing. Value is subjective. And I don't think any differently about Bitcoin today than I did yesterday. So the value of Bitcoin hasn't changed for me. And it certainly hasn't changed because of the price changed. Well, and I just want to say I grew up in working class Detroit. And in 2017, no, in uh, 2008, during the great financial crisis, my family we lost almost everything in Detroit. My husband lost his job, I lost my shop. So, you know, cult or culture, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, as you can see, I've brought my friends, I'm wearing my, my swag, and so I do enjoy the cult part a bit, but uh, I, I'm here for the Bitcoin and the culture, and I'm here for hope. And 
hope for the future of my family and my kids. Okay, question number two. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ben. All three of you, I consider leaders in uh, the Bitcoin community, and you all have different ways of building your communities. So what are your long-term goals and your long-term vision for your crypto clubs and Bitcoin clubs? Help. Help as many people as possible. Because there's a whole generation my age and above that that online doesn't work as well for some of you younger guys and gals. And it, it's, this is such a revolution of knowledge that knowledge is the weapon you have to have in order to fight in the revolution. And our club's sole focus is to educate the populace, the normal, the the average Joes and Janes, because while Washington, D.C., and, and all of the politicians and all the criminals and all of the, the elites are worried about who's actually going to take over the system, well, guess what the real system is? It's us. We are what built the system. arguing over is who controls us. That's why, and, and that's why I love Bitcoin, is, is whether you are a hardcore communist or a diehard anarchist, you agree on Bitcoin. And this is why. If you're a communist, Bitcoin is the ultimate it takes the richest son of a bitch in the world and it levels them with the poorest truck driver in the world because as the rich guy adds value to the network, it lifts up the little guy. And as the, li the little guy puts in as much as he can, raises up the rich guy a little bit, it raises all of us up. And... The libertarian aren't uh, capitalists. It's honest money. It is. It is. It is a digital representation of Austrian economics, which, if you understand Austrian economics, it's just the economics of nature. It's value-added economics. A seed you plant absorbs energy, grows big, grows value. A bigger tree has a bigger value. A big, big tree has a bigger value. It's just an exchange of energy. And that's what I want, is I want to get the little guys in as fast. I want to front run these fucking hedge funds. I want to front run all these rich people. Folks, I'll be honest, I'm fucking rich. But the wealthiest man in prison is still in fucking prison. <laughs> I mean, just to follow up on that, which is difficult, but... Uh, <laughs> Holding Bitcoin, holding real hard money is one of the greatest forms of charity you can do for your fellow human being. Uh, a, a high form of charity is donating in a way that uh, leaves and gives dignity to the people who are receiving that donation and you don't take any. So when you hold Bitcoin, you donate purchasing power to other Bitcoin holders and you increase their purchasing power and give them uh, a greater chance to afford the things that they want in life just by simply holding your money and not buying that fiat produced crap that's made out of plastic uh, and, and holding it because you think it has more value and you want better things for it and therefore you're donating to others. So it is, it's a tremendous form of charity. And, and to build on Prem's point is Bitcoin is not volatile at all. If you look at the system, the protocol, there's a block every roughly 10 minutes. 
Yeah, the block reward is the same. It's doing the same thing over and over. It's humans that are volatile. It's humans that are emotional. It's the humans that are FOMOing into and out of this asset class that are creating vol volatility in, in the dollar exchange rate price. Probably s since 2016, I have not told anyone to buy Bitcoin because like so many people, I told everyone and no one cared, right? No one cared. So. One of the reasons I started Bitcoin Brunch was because I didn't want to feel like I was invading someone's personal space by telling them about Bitcoin. And I didn't want to have that feeling anymore. So I started Bitcoin Brunch because now they come to me, right? Like you come to me, you know what I'm going to be talking about at Bitcoin Brunch. It's in the name, right? I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin. So I'm not inconveniencing anyone. I'm not burdening anyone. And I think it's important you know, when you, when you, whether you, I personally um, am very partial to Austrian economics. It's, I actually had, had studied Austrian economics before Bitcoin existed. So this is like tends to be an, a reversion for a lot of people. I'm not selling anything. There's no way that me explaining Bitcoin to you, exposing you to Bitcoin is necessarily going to benefit me. Yes, if the demand increases, yeah, the dollar price goes up. That's great. But my... Long-term goal is I want people to use Bitcoin. Um, you know, in, in one of the earlier panels, someone was like talking about, well, why, you know, and I agree, why would you ever spend Bitcoin if you could spend dollars? But, well, you can also spend and replace, right? So if there was a, a business or a person with whom I was gonna exchange value and they accepted Bitcoin, well, you know, I could just, if it was $100, I could just buy $100 of Bitcoin right then and there and then give them the Bitcoin. So. It, you know, you don't necessarily have to make that choice all the time if a, a, a merchant is accepting Bitcoin. But again, I just want to say, like, I'm not selling anything. I've got nothing to sell to you. I'm not trying to take advantage of you. So many of these projects, um, again, like I, I'm trying to take it from the perspective of a lot of people are not into Austrian economics. And then, so, OK, maybe you don't like some of the economics where a lot of these ideas come from, but I'm not trying to sell anything to you. So let's see where we can reach common ground. And it's often by reaching the common ground. I mean, one of the I think the, the big future goal for Bitcoin Brunch as I'm starting a nonprofit organization to try to like entrench Bitcoin education in Miami. Um, we need to find all the different things that inspire people or that motivate people. And then how does Bitcoin align with that? Because every single person comes to Bitcoin from a different point of view. And so that's, I think, having talked to so many people and met so many people, that's really what I want the future to be is, OK, we need to increase the effectiveness of our message. And we do that by figuring out what's important to the various different people <laughs> that come to the space. All right, well, that's a good lead into this question, which I'm gonna start with you, Prem. How do you feel about community members who are different from you? Is listening to as many opinions as you can the goal, or is gathering more people around you who are just like you the goal? I love diversity. I love clash of ideas, because that's what freedom is. When you have freedom, everyone can be themselves. When everyone starts to look the same, you have to wonder, is that really freedom? Are all these, do these people all really freely choose to start, you know, dressing the same and listening to all the same songs? And, you know, there's a lot about our society and the way our society is structured that, you know, you, you think you've got all this freedom, but really you don't realize the extent to which so much of what you're exposed to and so much of what's filling your head from such a young age is not you. It's other people imposing their ideas on you. <laughs> uh, this is a harder question than you really realize. Because, and that's why I revert to freedom is I don't care who you vote for. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care anything that makes you different than me. I don't care. But what we all have in common is our currency. We all use currency of one form or another. And what we at our, at our club, and thank you to my team, right, up here in front, 
right, is what we do is we educate and we have poker night and we have bingo night and we play music. I recently bought a food truck and I put it out in front of our location out in Sarasota. And it is the gaudiest thing you've ever seen in your life. It literally says Bitcoin Ben's Burger Bus. It, it, look, look us up on DoorDash. It's, it's the exposure. <laughs> uh, 90% of the people that walk in are like, you know, I've heard of Bitcoin, but I don't know where to go. And what you do is awesome. It's, it's, we need you to have your own place and be there to, Monday through this friggin' Sunday. That's the concept I actually came up with, was look, instead of these poor people trying to hop online and shift and try and figure out where they should learn what from, why not give them a place they can join and talk with people who are in love with Bitcoin and passionate. And, and that's why our clubs are growing so big. Because what I did was I took a, uh, I took a, a club model and I linked it with the fastest growing brand on the globe, which is Bitcoin. That's what Jeff Booth talks about. Companies are stupid for not putting a big Bitcoin on their, on some signage, on some advertising. Everyone knows what Bitcoin looks like or is. They know the brand and they've heard, oh, this guy got rich. That guy got rich. The, what's going to bring them to us is the curiosity of improving their personal income. What's going to keep them as a member is the knowledge of the revolution that's wrapped in the branding of Bitcoin. Yeah, I agree. It's a very difficult uh, question. I, it's something I struggle with, I think more so in my personal life as a result of the podcast in the sense that, you know, one of the reasons I started the podcast was so that my children could hear the questions I was asking and, and try and find the answers to. And uh, I try to bring on guests that have integrity and transpar transparency and honesty. And I, I, ideally, I want to be aligned with their thinking, though. I kind of, but, you know, I don't want to be aligned to the point where I'm excluding other thoughts and questions or ideas. But I find that there's a lot of preference falsification in society. So people in a group setting won't say how they really feel and they won't ask certain questions. And I find that I even get in, I get in trouble for asking certain questions. <laughs> you know, are the neighbors going to find out you asked that question, you know? Uh, care. Are, are the kids, friends, parents gonna find out you asked that question, are, you know? And it's not even about the answer, it's really, you know. And so I, I think it, there's this struggle of, you know, being around like-minded people, because you wanna uh, insulate yourself with security and a team, and you know, I think in my personal life, I definitely wanna be around people that are like-minded, but in the battlefield of ideas, I wanna explore things, and I wanna have the freedom to ask questions and not be afraid of, of letting people think critically for themselves. You don't have to agree with the answer. That's kind of the point. And even on my show, sometimes I'll bring on someone that I think has some amazing ideas and we'll get into an area that's 5% of the show that I completely disagree. And so I really make a mountain of that. Do I have a, uh, a debate now about something that's not really the biggest part of the show? Or just let the audience think for themselves and say, hey, maybe Seth doesn't agree with everything he said right there. You know, and I'll get emails from how could you let him say that on your show? You know, and it's so it, it's interesting, but I, I, I do I, I want to fight for people asking questions and for saying how they really feel about things. And I think especially in this environment, we are even politically. And this is one of the reasons why I asked, because I've seen this this uh, I don't even know how to describe it. The in inclusivity of Bitcoin and not not wanting to listen to what's happening around anybody else or help anyone else if God forbid they're a shitcoiner. 
or, you know, something like that. And I have friends who are shit corners. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm saying in the community, though, yeah. there's this perception that you can't, like, you have to be separate from that. And uh, I just think it's important to really hear everybody and not just be that inclusive. Yeah, and who gets to define what the community is, right? I mean, I, if I was... Um, and like I said, I've, been, I've kind of already laid some of my ideological stances on the table. If I was only willing to entertain and be around people who agreed with me, like I learned in uh, 2001 after the 9-11 attacks that I was going to be alone then. You know, like my opinions it's for a long time have just been against or not against, but I've just been different than what the mainstream narrative is. I was against the war in Iraq. I was against the Patriot Act. I was called, you know, an, an un-American terrorist sympathizer. So you're talking about more Get than 20 years ago right now, now, and I was around. in high school. And you know, and, and you have to make a choice. So either I'm gonna run around with some sort of uh, ideological bar that you've gotta, you know, you've gotta get over the bar or you can't be my friend. Well, that's gonna be a very, very lonely life for someone like me. So the only way for me to have friends, to have a social life, is to be willing to just accept people for who they are. And when it comes to something like Bitcoin, as I said earlier, it's about, okay, well, we, we're all human beings, regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our wealth and, and our preferences. We're all human beings. So we've got something in common. We're all breathing this same air and we can find common ground. And especially if my concern is for the, the future adoption of Bitcoin, I have to engage with people um, with whom I, uh, you know, have a lot of disagreement with, because otherwise, you know, how are we going to increase adoption? If, if the only people I talk to about it are people who agree with me, I mean, well, they already adopted it then. That's why we agree. So that seems kind of pointless to me. Yeah. And uh, that's why on, on my show and at our clubs, we preach freedom. It's, it's the only thing we can all agree on. You know, I mean, no one will argue against their own freedom. Oh, no, 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 enslave me, please. <laughs> and so what you have to realize and w w what we really push is you're only as free as the person you hate is free and I don't hate you I'm just <laughs> you're the closest person and uh, it's because if we all love freedom we actually love each other helping me realize why I have so few friends. I, I don't like being around people I don't agree with, like on a personal level. I like to debate, I'm argumentative. I, I like to hash it out. Uh, I like to hash out ideas, uh, but, but I get it. And I, I, li I like though, I'd rather be around someone who disagrees with me, but like backs it up and, and gives me something to kind of chew on than someone who just doesn't engage. So let me tell this quick anecdote. So in the three, and tomorrow will be three years, in the three years that I've been doing Bitcoin brunch, I've only asked one person to leave. And, you know, I have an open door policy. Anyone can come in. Is it all right if I come back now? <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, I don't think they hold any ill will towards me. I certainly don't hold any ill will towards them. But, as I, again, as I said, like, I, you know, at Bitcoin brunch, my... Pretty much my only rule is no shilling, right? Like I'm not shilling Bitcoin to anyone. I'm talking about it. I'm discussing it, different aspects of it, implications of it. Or my cash phrase used to be Bitcoin, the future of money and whatever else people want to talk about. And so I'm okay with, you know, we have like a regular um, crypto guy who his day job is like very, you know, he's neck deep in crypto. But when he comes to brunch, we just have an open, honest, sincere exchange of ideas. And that's perfectly fine with me because to me I see no difference between someone going out there and working in the crypto space and then someone going out there and working for dollars like the dollar is the number one shitcoin on this planet so how can I hold it against all these other people who you know maybe I don't agree with the way that you know like how they're trying to make their money or what how they define money but 
that's okay. Like I have to be worried about me and how I behave and how I present myself to the world and, and how other people, that's their problem. And I'm, I, Well, let me say that is one of my favorite things about Bitcoin Brunch is that it's not all hardcore Bitcoin maxis. People come for all kinds of reasons and they're willing to listen and they're willing to learn. And that's a testament to you, Brad. And we have disagreements for sure. We have debates, we have arguments. There's no doubt because I, even with, you know, Bitcoin maxis, I have some really fundamental (laughs) disagreements about certain things. Uh, I'm actually with you. I love to argue. I I love to argue. (laughs) I love to get into heated, I mean, deep level debates on Austrian economics versus Keynesian, you know, progressive versus conservative versus libertarian. You know, you have to... Anyone who's married knows this. You have to argue. You have to. Never avoid an argument because an argument leads to a resolution. And that's the goal of all of us. We want a resolution for each of us. But each of those resolutions don't have to be the same. And... That's why I want you on my show, I'll flip-flop you. You go on mine, I'll go on yours. And we can argue for hours, and at the end of it, I'm gonna tell. Hey, uh, Ben, Yeah. we can argue too. <laughs> well, oh, trust me, I'm gonna get us all on here. And it's, I love the argument because arguing isn't hate. Arguing is passionate debate. And when you passionately debate, guess what? You might passionately fucking learn something. (laughs) Because, like I said, I'm married, so inside my house, I'm 90% wrong. (laughs) And... It's, yeah, I'm a bubble. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the argument is the road to liberty. That's the argument. The problem is, is when we quit arguing. The moment you quit arguing is when someone picks up a weapon. And that's not good. You're reading my mind. Like, the argumentation is the only nonviolent way to resolve conflict. It's the only choice. Either you argue it out or you fight. There's no other way to resolve conflict between human beings. It's just as simple as that. You're reading my mind. <laughs> All right, guys, I got one last question. You are Whoever both wants not to... only good looking, <laughs> we're both intelligent. I also wanted to say, you know, like, one thing I've realized in myself, and certainly with other people at Bitcoin Brunch, like a, a lot of people, we don't want to change our minds. But I relish the opportunity to change my mind. I relish the opportunity to be shown that I'm wrong about something because that means I can be a little more right afterwards. <laughs> and that's what I want. I, I am dedicated to truth. You know, not to my ego and what I think is true and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put other people. No, I relish, please. Break me down, break down my mental models and show me the light because I will look at it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll let whoever wants to pick this one up first. So if all the experts are live on Twitter, okay, why do they need you? Why, do, why does anyone need you if all the experts live on Twitter already? Well, because not everyone's on Twitter, I guess. And also, what the fuck's an expert? <laughs> I, the experts kind of fucked us in 2008. The experts definitely fucked us in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. Uh, now they're fucking us again. These experts are not very good. 
So what I think we should do is we should actually meet on Sunday, come to the club, watch his show, and let's argue. Because the experts aren't arguing, they're dictating. And I'll tell you what, nobody likes a dick. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think the experts, uh, so to speak, are on Twitter. They're influencers. They are uh, attention seekers and, and attention uh, funnelers. And it's one thing that I, I've experienced so much at Bitcoin Brunch is that I really don't set an agenda. You know, I mean, people who come, you know that I, I, I have an, a series of essays that I started writing a few months into brunch because I don't set any agenda. I really don't set any topics. I don't restrict what we talk about. And because of that, we get a lot of just diverse, random, all kinds of thoughts going back and forth. And so I started writing these essays because at 2 p.m. I said, okay, guys, I've been here for four hours now. You've been here for however long you've been here. Please, let's just take a few minutes and let me just stick an idea out there and then think about it. Just think about it. So why, like the role that I can play and the role that I do play is that it, okay, come to Bitcoin Brunch and no one's an influencer here. No one's an expert here. No one is a celebrity here. We're all fellow human beings and express yourself and let's see what comes out of it. And you're gonna get a lot of ideas and information and you're gonna get beyond like the, the superficial in a way that you're not gonna get from these virtual venues that are so heavily influenced by whether it's the, the platform itself or the, the special interests of the people who are, you know, the influencers who are controlling everyone's attention or if it's the advertisers. There's all of these other influences that are just trying to control how the narrative is and where it's going. And I've said this for years, I mean, because I started brunch, you know, during the pandemic. I said, in person, face to face is the only way in 2024 that we can interact without being filtered, without being controlled, without being algorithmatized. <laughs> this is definitely one of my favorite things about Bitcoin Brunch. And to sit there and people come in, and there are people every week that, I, that I've never met. And they come in and they leave, and the conversation is always engaging, and it's because you've put that in place. So, well done. That's really great. I mean, I'm just curious, I mean, it seems like you guys probably with a lot of newcomers, often people aren't as educated or informed. H how do you guys find the patience or uh, how do you, I, I find that it'd be frustrating to always start to, at square zero with someone or square one and not build that rapport and, and constantly going through that churn. Well, well, at our club, and that's why I wanted a brick in a place that they can come. They walk into us, so they have curiosity. So we aren't really pushing anything they don't want to hear, you know. And uh, and it's they are frightened of. I'll phrase it this way: they're looking for a solution. That's what everyone who walks into our club is looking for a solution. They have different problems, but they're all looking for a solution. And, and how we actually talk with them is we talk to them about them. Why, what brings you here? Is it your curiosity? Do you want to, end, do you just want to make money? Or is it freedom? Is it liberty? Is it history? Is it education? Or, or are you just here to play poker and have a few drinks? Ben, do you feel like it evolves sometimes? Like they come in and, and they think one thing and then they, Every it, time. it evolves into something else? Every time. It, uh, we have guys who have like, like, oh, let's go play poker down at, you know, Bitcoin Ben's crazy club or whatever he calls it. And they'll walk in, they're playing poker. Next thing you know, 
everyone else is talking Bitcoin and money and yeah, I'd see the price of eggs in you know, the grocery store. Then they're like, well, actually, I did see the price of eggs, God damn it. It's bullshit. And so then they're hooked because if, if you, when you walk into our club, it's such a different environment. It's, it's a ring of ideas. It's a ring of challenging yourself and challenging others who want to be challenged. It's, it's literal. Right, right here is my number one guy, Mr. Bamboo Ben. Right? He, he basically runs our Sarasota club. We always have people who walk in thinking one thing and an hour later, they, I'll be, I'll be back tomorrow. They, they join our club and they're like, I'll be, I'll be back tomorrow. Because they're like, why, why, why would I go to a movie theater? Why would I, why would I go to the shopping mall? This, this is an area of ideas, and I can talk, and I have free speech. We don't censor anybody. Now, if you get drunk and you're an asshole, we got a big guy that'll throw your ass out. But we'll never censor someone's ideas, because ideas are, are sharpeners. The sharpest knives require the sharpest rocks. They're two separate things. Well, you know, when I started brunch three years ago, my intention was not to be like, a, to be explaining Bitcoin to anyone, to introduce Bitcoin to anyone. I had this sort of delusional, utopic idea that, you know, all the people who've been in Bitcoin like me for several years, like they're going to come out and hang out with me, right? Because I didn't know anyone in person. Like none of my friends or family were into Bitcoin. So I had this really like, you know, yeah, I'm really hopeful. And I've met a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, OG or whatever you want to call it. But the reality is when you have an open door policy, when, you know, the word gets out, you're you just, you don't know what's going to walk through that door. So I'll get newcomers who don't know anything or who think that Bitcoin is the same thing as Ethereum. Um, I'll get, you know, entrepreneurs who are looking for investors and they think that Bitcoin brunch is where they're going to find, you know, millions of dollars for their startup. I, all kinds of people have come through Bitcoin brunch. And absolutely every single different type of person that I didn't expect has sharpened me. They have... They have improved my ability to talk about and discuss Bitcoin um, in an open fashion, in a critical fashion. Um, they've improved my understanding. They've, they've pushed me to deepen my own understanding of how Bitcoin works. So I would say three years ago, I understood very little about the technical side of Bitcoin. And even though I'm not a developer still, I understand much better today about the technical side. And I can, to some extent, defend myself on the technical side. So, you know, absolutely. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I actually would like to say something. You are amazing. You are amazing. And all of you are just as, as amazing as these two. What about me? What's happening? What's wrong? You are, you're given, hon. We all know you're amazing. It's no matter you're going to hear a lot of education up up here, and you you you're going to listen to some great, intelligent, intellectual Bitcoiners and 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 economics and and all that. But what it really comes down to is freedom. We're all here for either economic freedom, cultural freedom. Some of us are very political. I am. Uh, it's, 
if we all can just agree on freedom and argue about the rest, we're good. I do want to say a little bit off topic. I am also a one issue voter, but my one issue is war. It's, it has been since 9-11 and it's always going to be war. I will never support a candidate who, who is willing to take us to war. Um, freedom. So <laughs> you're Trump. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about that during lunch. <laughs> oh, and I also wanted to introduce our, our last chair panel. Um, hey, yo. As part of the community, we've got Yellow. And if he's on, he's probably the funniest thing in Twitter. I don't know if you know him, but he's funny. Um, his girlfriend, Pink, who he doesn't like anymore. So now Pink and Pablo the bull, the Bitcoin bull, are now dating. So it's kind of a mess, but and it's all part of the community. They, they will all be at brunch tomorrow. So they if you want to meet brunch. Yellow, come to brunch tomorrow from 10 to 3. You're all very, very welcome to come. <laughs> And you can also wear the Bitcoin giant necklace at brunch. Bling. <laughs> Ooh, Cedric, let's see it. Did you do any uh, questions, uh, Mel? You? Yeah, anyone Did have you? any questions, please. What was the biggest mistake you made starting your community for the gentleman who have been versus? I waited too long. Yeah. Wow. I sh you know, in, in, in 2016, when I was burning out on trying to follow all the developments and trying to find the, you know, like trying to convince my friends and family what I should have been doing was I should have been connecting with people who were already Bitcoiners. So, you know, I waited too long, but I don't live in regret. I'm happy I did it when I did it. <laughs> when I started my show, I uh, naively thought I needed a producer and I quickly learned that not your keys, not your show. <laughs> so I had to fight very hard to get my show back, and uh, I wouldn't do it the same way again twice. I would start from, I'd want my show to be sovereign from the beginning, so. Anybody else? Oh, yes. So the video of the Ohio State students the <laughs> and the commencement speaker, I can't remember saying, brave soul, you know, uh, uses the word Bitcoin, and I've been in that stadium, and it's enormous, and half of it's bullying. And how do you how do you see that and not get either infuriated or depressed? I mean, I know it's an education thing, but the thing that I took away from that was I suspect if you went and spoke to 99% of those people who were booing, they didn't know jack about Bitcoin. <laughs> so how do you take this indoctrination or just the reflexivity of, well, we don't like that, especially among a group of people who are probably all facing an enormous amount of debt and praying that, you know, the government, quote unquote, us, is going to pay for it for them. How do you approach that? How do you, how, if you had a chance to go and talk to 20 of those people, what do you say? Well, how I view it is the revolution is going to happen in only about 10 or 15 percent of us will realize it even happened. You know, the Revolutionary War here in America, actually most of America didn't even know what the hell was going on. And that's okay, because we are passionate. We are the warriors for freedom. Not, ev not everyone's a warrior, and that's okay. As for those who actively booed it, I think that was a chosen video clip and it it really didn't show it it showed a what did it show it showed a voice and a crowd that boo that we heard that was mostly the one voice but yet we perceptively saw a crowd so we assumed that the majority of the crowd or the crowd was booing. When in reality, no one listened to what that fucking guy's saying at that point anyway. Have you ever been to a graduation? <laughs> no one gives a fuck what that guy's saying. They want to go home. <laughs> right. You'd... You're trying to remember where the fuck you parked.
heart and where you're going to go for dinner. <laughs> so I think it was an illusion th that we placed on ourselves of importance. It, it's not relative to the revolution. And anyone who doesn't understand Bitcoin just doesn't understand it yet. I think um, I think if they went crazy, we, we'd know we were at a, like some sort of cycle top. So I'm kind of relieved wow. that they didn't go crazy. Uh, but I also think they, they, they see Bitcoin in the way that everything else in the economy appeals, appears to them is another asset that's run far away from them. And uh, unfortunately, he, I don't think was, uh, that wasn't the right moment to shill Bitcoin. They're not there to listen to be shilled to. Uh, they're there to celebrate. And the way he shilled it to them was by showing them how housing's got on affordable. So now it's, it's a double whammy, housing. And he just showed them the two things that they feel most unaffordable right now for them. So I, I, it just, it, it wasn't a good opportunity to resonate with that crowd, I think, at all. But to your point, we don't know what, the greater crowd really said it, that was a really good point that you made about the video we were all shown first and the way it was a very tight shot of a very big crowd and you're only hearing maybe 15 to 20 people at tops you don't know what 60,000 people are doing but I wouldn't be surprised if the crowd was very lukewarm to Bitcoin I mean just all the context uh, but to your point too there they could use that asset more than anyone else in the world right now with the economy they're facing. So it's unfortunate. It's lunchtime. Everybody, give them a nice round of applause. All right, it's lunchtime, everyone. That's right. Feel free to carry on. Great conversations. We got some good fun coming up. A lunch by the Takisa Tacos. And then we got a special performance coming up as well. Tatiana Moros is here. To